Hi, welcome to the International Space Station Flight Control Room. We are here where the Orbit 2 team now is monitoring the systems aboard the International Space Station and also the crew's activities. Here with me today, I have uh, Tara Rutley. Tara, thank you for coming. Tara is the Associate Program Scientist for uh, International Space Station. And so what she's going to do, we're going to ha have here today is a uh, just a wrap-up of it's this, we're going to call this Science Friday. So what we're going to do today is have a wrap-up of science that has been um, being worked on on orbit um, all during this week, and then we have some other little things that we want to talk about um, that had uh, gone up on the uh, SpaceX Dragon spacecraft that is going to be leaving uh, Sunday this weekend. So welcome, Tara. First of all, before we get into any of, of all this stuff, I just want you to explain to me a little about your roles and responsibilities here as the uh, program scientist for International Space Station. Sure. Uh, let's see. Well, there are many. Um, first and foremost, I'm involved in helping to coordinate the research plans that happen on Space Station and uh, look across all investigations. And then as the investigations are happening on orbit, I help um, identify um, impacts to science that may be uh, important for pursuing or promoting the, the science that happens on station. So we help prioritize the science, make sure it gets implemented, we meet the needs of the investigators. And then after the experiments are done, our team works to get the results and turn them into something that's communicable to the public. So we try to communicate the value of what's happening on space station as okay, well. Okay, great. Um, okay, so we're gonna we're gonna do a little recap of some of the science that's been taking place. And there's a lot of science, and I think that that's that's going on. A lot of times we hear a lot about you know oh we had to fix this or we had to fix that. And and while we got to understand that this is their home that is orbiting, so there are, there is maintenance that is required, but, but meanwhile, it is a laboratory, and right. we don't want to forget that, and, and that science is taking place every day, 24-7, even when the crew is sleeping at times, um, mm -hmm. depending on what the, the experiment is or the study. So um, first, before we get into some of these um, experiments or investigations that are taking place this week, I want to go and talk about this um, education publication. There was a recent publication mm -hmm. that was done, and, and really kind of goes over some all the, the history of the space station science. Mm -hmm. You want to go ahead and talk sure, about that? Sure, yeah. Um, just this month, our office put out a new publication. Um, it's called Inspiring the Next Generation, and it's basically a compilation of the results of the student participation in space station over the last 12 years. So just about, just about every investigation that happens on, on orbit has some kind of educational component, whether it's true student design and competition, um, where it's actual student experiments on orbit, or, or it could be just um, all the way back to on-orbit uh, activities that can be pursued in the classroom in parallel, um, even, uh, even crew call downs to students. All of these things are rolled into this publication in an effort to communicate the value of station in a way that promotes science, technology, engineering, and math. So the STEM is real critical, right, to, to space station value. And um, what we found is, is going through the publication as we were putting it together, looks like space station has reached students across students and teachers across 44 different countries wow. in the last 12 years and about 44 42 million students have been reached and it, on some level involving space station activities which is really really mind-blowing and um, nearly three million teachers as well yeah so uh, it, it was yeah it was pretty eye-opening as we were going through and now the publication also details how you as students and teachers can get on board and participate in competitions that are up and coming and that are always ongoing. So if you feel like this is something you want to look through, which I highly encourage, if you have ideas, if you're a student and you, you have some ideas, you're not sure where to go, this publication is really a great place for you to start because you can see what other students have done and some of the results and how you can participate. And to do that, you can, um, we have copies that are coming out in print this month, but, uh, but in the meantime, it's online right now. If you go to www.nasa.gov forward slash ISS dash science, you can find there's a for teachers section and a for students section. And if you click on those links, there's lots of information there, and you can find um, um, the online version of in terms of PDF format for this publication. Great. Thank you for yeah, sharing check that. It That's out. really good good information there. Mm -hmm. um, so let's go ahead and talk about a couple of the, the experiments that are taking place this week, and, and you know, they're, they're going to be ongoing, but one of the things um, I know is the meter on, and this is something that Sunny was working with 
earlier this morning to deactivate and that sort of thing. Can you? We have. I think we have a little picture here. Yeah. Of Meteoron. And yeah. There he is. This this little guy is actually called Mockup, and he's part of the Meteoron Project, which is an ESA, European Space Agency sponsored investigation that will actually happen over a period of two to three years on station. And the goal of this Meteoron Project is to um, is to check out and 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 just basically characterize and understand human robotic interaction from when you're on orbit and, and down to Earth. So it's a un, uh, unique um, capability to be able to, what Sunny did this week, which, which was pretty cool, was she actually controlled this little creature called Mockup from ISS, and this Mockup is located at a ESA control facility in, um, in uh, Germany. So she actually commanded it from space, and, and it was pretty exciting. Uh, the robot, from what I understand, is, is on a, uh, in an area that's simulated with, you know, a simulated Mars environment. So what mm -hmm. you're doing is simulating controlling a robot from far, far away uh -huh. in space. And uh, so I understand that the communication hesitation or delay was only two to three seconds from oh. when Sunny sent a command to when the little robot did perform her command. Um, and then, um, so really what this is proving out is something called delay tolerance networking and so a really critical component of, mm -hmm. of technology demonstration from for, for use on space station is being able to use technology that is going to take us beyond low earth orbit right mm -hmm. so um, delay tolerant networking is a series of network uh, communications established for uh, for networks like space station that have loss of signal and and, it, and their DTNs mm -hmm. delay tolerant networks on on, on earth as well mm -hmm. so anytime that we lose signal on orbit what happens is the little packets of information get stored and then can uh, be, uh, I guess you could think, projected forward once the communication is reestablished. Mm -hmm. So this is a way for us to test out uh, a very basic um, human-robot interaction along with the DTN network and think about how we would evolve these robotic features out past just this little mock-up robot. Now, mock-up's the first, but in the series over the next several years, ESA plans to... Um, progress and, and all the way up to uh, exoskeleton type wearable uh, components, human robotic interaction. So basically you can don a, a big arm or a glove and control it that way uh, versus just computer and joystick, uh, which is up on station now. Wow. Yeah. So, okay. so Meteoron uh, is really good example technology demonstration. It's very visible. It's really fun to watch, and um, and um, we're looking forward to just just more progression as this one yeah. goes on. So what she did actually with her commanding uh, Meteoron or the the mock-up mm -hmm. from the space station was almost a little uh, reverse of what we see here because here the ground teams will often be operating the exactly. robotics, you know, exactly. on station. So that's, that's right. kind of interesting to see that. Mm -hmm. Great. So um, another one we have here, I have a list. This one I, I like um, just because I like fitness and this kind Me of thing. So too. I want to talk about VO2 max. And mm -hmm. I understand it's not really that fun to do. <laughs> I pretty strenuous <laughs> yeah so um maybe sunny enjoys it because she loves fitness so much but i don't know um <laughs> so talk to me a little about vo2 max what exactly i mean it's it's your measure the measurement of your aerobic capacity but tell, tell me why is this important yeah vo2 max it it's a measurement like you said of aerobic capacity so how how well the crew members can take up their oxygen as they're exercising. And, it, and it's done on Earth, too, in athletes and, and anyone who's interested. And, and it represents, it's a reflection of your cardio fitness, your cardiovascular fitness, and your respiratory fitness. And that has huge impacts on your physical overall uh, capabilities. Mm -hmm. And so um, in terms of crew members, the reason why I want to check it out is because, you know, when the crew has to potentially maybe emergency egress, what kind of fitness are they in? What kind of cardio and respiratory shape are they in? Can they do it? Um, can they go on long, uh, intense EVAs if we should go beyond lo low Earth orbit and, and, and arrive at a terrestrial location that they have to get out and start really manually laboring for a while? So um, so the really cool thing about VO2 Max is that it just it directly measures the, the crew as they're exercising. The crew breathes into a device and out of a device as they're really high intensity exercising. they got to go max. That's what the max stands for. Sure. So it's pretty intense. And the device that they're breathing in uh, measures the carbon dioxide to oxygen ratio that they are taking in and producing, and then their calculations back on how efficient their their lungs and their cardiovascular system are. And uh, with VO2 Max this week, there was the very last session that was performed uh, ever. So they wrapped up a study that I think has been ongoing since 2009, huh? and they needed 12 subjects to be successful. 
uh, human subjects. And human subjects is valuable um, and very sought after commodity on space station, but it's very critical to the human research program that we understand these things before we go beyond low Earth, or or low Earth orbit. So it's really cool to get the last subject in. Um, now they're, they're needed 12 and they got additional two more for good measure. As a scientist, you want to make sure you cover all your bases right, and you have as right. much data as possible. And so I understand though, before they do this, they actually do their VO2 max, measure that before yes. they leave so they have a baseline for Absolutely. comparison and then on orbit and then didn't and then return again, again. On, on post flight. Yeah, pre flight, well. in flight, and, and on return to, to just measure across how much is lost and then how much they actually will regain back once they once they land as well I over how, time. How they compare with some of the uh, the Olympic yeah. athletes. <laughs> I don't athletes know. Maybe Sunny will want to find <laughs> that out. That high, high numbers. <laughs> okay, so the next one, this one's kind of a fun one too. And actually, we were talking about this earlier. Um, uh, Aki was uh, actually just measuring the, the water volume of this particular habitat, and it's called the aquatic habitat. And this is kind of exciting because yeah. um, it's for fish. It's fish. Fish in there space. Yep, so talk to me a little about this. Yeah, this is the fun. This is the fun stuff, right? So, so the aquatic habitat was actually itself. The hardware was launched this summer on an HTV vehicle, and in the meantime, the crew have been working on and off to set up the water, the test the pH, get all the bubbles out. Surprisingly, bubbles were a bad thing to have in in a fluid environment in space. Uh, set up the filtration units and get ready for the fish that just arrived on 32S. And I heard as of this morning, the fish, uh, madaka fish, have been inserted into the into the aquarium. And so the purpose of these madaka fish um, are is to basically start an investigation that looks at the development of fish over time in microgravity. The longest time a fish, a particular fish, has lived in microgravity has has been about 16 days or so on space shuttle missions. Um, and so now we're looking at a breeding tank that can hold fish over three different generations of breeding. And these, bre these fish breed pretty quickly, I think over two to three weeks. And so you can start to see different generations of development. And if you and you can also look at them under a microscope, you can tag them with red and green colors that you see on the screen that drive certain cells to behave in a certain way. You can see what's happening with those certain cells. So if you tag bone cells red, you can see what's happening to the bones, the skeletal system in these fish as they evolve in a microgravity environment. Mm -hmm. Crew on orbit, the longer they stay, they face muscle and bone loss because of disuse. They're not using it as often as they are in, on Earth. And so we want to understand some of the issues associated with that, the processes that control that. And one way you can do it is through these fish, especially as you look at their development over time. So the first study will look at um, the bone development and, and sub, sub, uh, in the uh, sub so follow-on studies. <laughs> I backed myself in a corner with that one. Uh, follow-on studies will look at other parts, other different physiological processes of the fish. And really cool it would be to see just how they develop and what they end up acting like and looking yeah. like after generations of, in space. Yeah. So it's exciting. So and, and you mentioned 32S, so that just arrived. So you were talking about the Soyuz with uh, Kevin Ford yep. and his and his two cosmonaut uh, crewmates as well. So yeah, and they just arrived this week. Thirty-two so fish are now uh, on station, and um, very cool. Most of them are inside the aquarium. So very very yeah. cool. Very cool. Um, okay, so um, last but not least, we have one other one, and um, Sunny was uh, also working a little bit with it. Um, I think just re replacing it mm -hmm. um, on on station this morning, and this is called a micro six. Yes. Um, one thing about Micro 6 is it actually came up, and, and I want to talk about more other things. This is something that they're working on this week, but it is one that actually arrived at the International Space Station aboard the uh, first yes. resupply cargo craft, uh, commercial resupply cargo craft, yeah. the Dragon, which is actually set to splash down, depart from the uh, station and splash down on Sunday. Yep. But um, So talk to me first. I want to talk about more science that was brought up on Dragon, but first talk to me a little about Micro 6 since that's something that they have been working on during this week as well. Absolutely. Micro 6, it's what's called a sortie, and we haven't had sorties since um, retirement of shuttle. So a sortie is an investigation that you can you launch up on a vehicle, activate it, during the time that the vehicle stocked and then return it right away home. And since we haven't had return capabilities, um, we haven't had a sortie in a long time. So Micro 6 is one of two sorties that are on um, station right now. 
and um, and it's coming home. Like you said, I saw the video of, of Sunny packing these these what's called these gaps, these circular components inside of a of a, a return uh, box that's coming home on SpaceX. And inside of these particular gaps, that's what the hardware is called, is a type of yeast called Candida albicans. And and Candida albicans is a normal um, part of the microflora and fauna, flora that are located in your gut. And they're, they're, they're part of who we are, but sometimes if your balance of these microbes inside your gut get off, uh, these yeast, these type of yeast, can um, become more active and take over and cause uh, issues such as yeast infections and, and thrust in the mouth. And so these, these infections can become an issue mm -hmm. on Earth, but you can imagine they can also become an issue in space as well. So we're in, interested, in, interested in them in terms of crew health, but what's really cool about the microgravity environment is that we found with the way bacteria behave and other microbes that sometimes certain ones become more aggressive in space, and so they'll upregulate their kind of nastiness. And so, um, so with that, we've been able to identify types of genes that are involved in driving uh, that kind of aggressiveness. And if you can identify the types of genes that are involved in that behavior, you can potentially get to a cure or a vaccine or a treatment sure. quicker. Mm -hmm. So that's what's being done with the Micro 6 investigation. The scientists who are sending this one up are going to get the samples home and they're going to look at things like what genes were upregulated in these cells as they were incubated on space station in the microgravity environment. Right. Right. And then they might think about what might cause their activation based on these genes that, that are that are activated. What's causing this? What about the microgravity environment that's doing it? They're also going to look at their sh their physical structure because when uh, sometimes when microbes become aggressive, part of that is that they create biofilms and they start. That's a good way for them to communicate and hang out with each other and mm -hmm. become more aggressive. And then lastly, uh, I understand that this investigation is also testing an antifungal treatment. So uh, it'll be interesting to see the response in the in the cultures to this antifungal treatment as they were cultured in microgravity. So these guys are going to come home on SpaceX, and, um, and we're looking forward to those results. They're one of many that are going to come home. Uh, about 400 kilograms are coming home on SpaceX in support of countless investigations. My job right now is to untangle the countless number of investigations that are actually coming home. Wow. Uh, they range from um, cold stowage samples, which is a new capability for us as well. We haven't yep. had that since shuttle's gone mm -hmm. away. Being able to return samples that are frozen or cold, um, like the blood and the urine, the critical human samples, the critical plant tissue samples, um, things that have been up and in the freezers in space station for a while and need to come home before uh, they expire, so to speak, and, and the cells start to break down. So the science returns on these is critical, and that's a big return capability of SpaceX. And we also have some ambient samples coming home um, in terms of materials, even some um, some ambient samples that don't require uh, that are human-based that don't require freezing as well. We also have physical sciences capabilities, some material samples that are being returned, and even video tapes of the data that was taken during investigations on on orbit as well. So it's going to be fully loaded. We've we've maximized our capacity for return on on SpaceX. About 200 kilograms went up on SpaceX to support about, oh, any, we have 165 investigations going on right now uh, in this six-month period. So it, it probably doesn't support every single one of them, but a good handful of those are being supported in the up mass of SpaceX, and the return is going to be really it's exciting. It's going to be a big deal, not yeah. just this, you know, the splashdown and being able to the scene of it all, and but knowing that this stuff is home and it's returned safely and yeah. we can collect and, you know, get some information out of there that could be useful to us, not only in space and our, our endeavor there, but also here on Earth, because some of these, uh, a lot of these um, studies that we're doing, you know, on the station also have application to us here on Earth, so Absolutely. I think it's very, very important. And as we know, we um, also, the SpaceX Dragon is um, going to be uh, splashing down on Sunday. It departs from the uh, International Space Station Sunday morning. Um, we'll have live coverage for you here on NASA television of the, uh, the unbirth and the release. Um, and that will start at 6 a.m. Central Time Sunday. Again, watch that. And then I uh, will give you, we'll provide some video later that afternoon of the, uh, of the uh, splashdown. Um, and here are some uh, of the time matches of everything that's going to be taking place. Again, the uh, coverage will begin at 6 a.m. Central Time here on NASA television with a release schedule for 8.26 a.m. and splashdown later at 2.20 p.m. that afternoon. 
Tara, thank you so much for coming here and Thanks giving us this me. Science Friday and giving us a wrap up again. Like I said, it's I think it's a very important element and something that, you know, we too often get caught up in in the whole, you know, we got to keep our home clean and yeah. clean and maintain, but there's it is a laboratory. That's right. And uh, so thank you very much. And we also have a website you can go to yep. at uh, www.nasa.gov. Uh, slash station slash research and you can find all the information you want yep that's and, it. Uh, and then some yeah and thank you again for coming out thanks it's always so fun to come talk it so thanks for inviting me great thank you